South African Youth Choir that has been entertaining us for the last uh, 20 minutes or so. And, <laughs> and an apt way, really, to start what is a special event on a special day, not only for us here at the city of Cape Town, but uh, indeed for South Africa as a whole. The last time I had the wonderful delights of the South African Youth Choir performing was at the opening of the Zeitzmacher Museum at the V&A Waterfront. And right there, of course, was one of the jewels of South Africa, who today celebrates 90 years old, the Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, born on this day in 1931 in Klarstorp. And I wonder whether his mother, Ellen Dorothea Mafutsek uh, Matlare, that's a real name, and his father, Zachariah Zelilo Tutu, had any idea that the son that they were giving birth to would go on to have such an impact on South Africa and indeed all of humanity. So on behalf of all of the citizens of Cape Town, uh, Desmond Tutu, have a wonderful, wonderful celebration today. And it is so, so lovely to still have you around because you continue to be the moral compass that we need in this country. So happy birthday to Desmond Tutu. He'll be spending the day, of course, with family, and I imagine that his beautiful wife, Nomali Zolia Dudu, will be taking very good care of her. My name is Africa Melane. It's my joy and pleasure to be your host for this afternoon as we launch the City of Cape Town's Climate Change Action Plan. Uh, the city uh, is, for the last two years, been engaged in putting together this plan, in part because we need to align our ambition with a global recognized urgency of addressing climate change. We all, we have very recent memory in counting down to day zero, not too long ago in the city of Cape Town, how severe the impact of climate change can be. But we also form part of a global city of networks, a network of cities rather, called the C40. And we have an obligation as part of that uh, network to produce a plan that we are launching here today. And it's uh, to the delight of Cape Town to have done so ahead of deadline and schedule. We hope that you'll be engaging with the plan, that you will interrogate it, that you'll hold discussions and deliberations around it. And most importantly, you will ask yourself how you can be part of it. Because ultimately, uh, this is a call for all of us to act for a stronger Cape Town. Today, we have an incredible list of uh, speakers who will be introducing and speaking and responding to the plan, uh, inspiring you to participate and engage with it. And I'll be introducing you to them in a moment. And of course, we invite you you joining us virtually to use the chat function on the platform to post any comments and questions you may have. We will not be able to answer your questions while the event is out of the way, um, but our team is going to uh, be providing feedback post the event and of course we'll give a summary of some of the comments and questions posed and hopefully bring you the answers uh, to that. The purpose of the launch is not only to present to you what the action plan is for the city of Cape Town, uh, and of course, its primary purpose is to mitigate against any future impact that is gonna be brought on by climate change. But uh, we also hope that you'll be inspired by the opportunity that it holds, opportunity for the city and indeed the residents of the city. Uh, the green economy is an economy that holds uh, immense potential to address many of the socioeconomic challenges that you reflect on on a daily basis in Cape Town. So we hope that in that action plan, you will also identify the opportunity for yourself to be engaged. I will now uh, acknowledge all of the important people who are in the room and invite all the speakers to uh, accept that this is the protocol that will be observed for the rest of the afternoon. We have the executive mayor of the city of Cape Town, Dan Plato, who will be addressing us shortly to officially open and uh, offer a message of support, obviously, for this uh, launch. Uh, we have members of the mayoral committee member, particularly um, Councillor um, Matleti, or who we'll be hearing from a little bit later as well. We've got portfolio committee members, uh, both uh, in the room as well as uh, joining us virtually, executive directors, directors, 
We have the C40 regional director joining us. Uh, we'll be hearing an address from him uh, live from Johannesburg. Uh, we've got the vice chair for Africa, uh, Mayor Sauer, joining us from Accra as well. And we're hoping to hear from him a little bit later. We have senior representatives of partner organizations. Uh, we'll have a message of support from the Western Cape government and uh, officials from the provincial government are also joining us both uh, in the venue as well as virtually. And of course, commissions and development agencies, uh, all protocol has been observed and we welcome you warmly uh, to this incredible uh, event. Um, Dia Bonga Bawo is the song that the South African Youth Choir was singing uh, just at the end there, which translates to, uh, we are grateful, God. Uh, we are. We are privileged enough to live in one of the most beautiful cities in the world, without a doubt or question. The weather today is showing off like never before. But this is a complex city that we live in, and it is all our responsibility, individually and collectively, to ensure that future generations get to enjoy this beautiful city and this beautiful country of ours. Um, a lot of that will obviously inspire the um, launch and much of the content that is in the action plan that we are launching today. But without further ado, please welcome to the lectern the Executive Mayor of the City of Cape Town, Alderman Dan Plater. Good afternoon, all the important guests in this room and all the other guests outside. Uh, it's indeed a wonderful day in Cape Town, and let me just once again use the opportunity to say to Arts a happy birthday. I've done it officially already, but it is so appropriate at this forum also just to, to recognize uh, a 90-year-old guy today. Definitely uh, a milestone. Uh, let me also use the opportunity to, to welcome uh, Councillor Pendile Makuti, our mayoral committee member uh, for energy, Councillor Solelo, our portfolio chair. I see James Foss walk in a minute or so ago. Councillor, thank you for your presence. Uh, some of our executive, di yeah, there's Councillor Fry as well. Um, some of our executive directors, Kadri, Dalian Campbell, Kadri Nasib, obviously, and uh, Edie Michael Webster in front of me. I don't see any other executive director. I nearly miss Councillor Gregory Peck. Oh, there's another one sitting, and that is our human settlements executive director, uh, Edie Giba. And then we are friends. And yes, one capable friend sitting right here in front of me. Uh, Dr. Hildegard, thank you for your presence as well. I'm not sure if any of your other colleagues are here, but all of you, all the other provincial, lovely provincial people, thank you for your presence. We appreciate you, thank you. Um, lovely day in Cape Town indeed, and let me use the opportunity to say to all the other people online, other mayors, other MACO members, other senior staff, senior representatives from the outside world. Thank you for being part of this wonderful event, climate and climate change and the environment, very important topics, not only in Cape Town, not only in South Africa, but across the world. And that is why I am so pleased to welcome our in-person and online audiences to this momentous occasion of the launch of the City of Cape Town's new Climate Change Action Plan. And there on your chairs you will see copies of the Action Plan. Changes to the world's climate are a global concern, as I've alluded to already, and have already resulted in significant economic, social and en environmental impact. Cape Town has first-hand experience of these severe negative effects on people, the environment and the economy, a prolonged drought and devastating fires being some of our more recent shocks. However, our city also has a great experience as to our residents, business, civil society and local government can pull together to overcome adversity. 
Our current experience of the COVID-19 pandemic is further evidence that global shocks and stresses have an enormous impact on cities and their futures. Ultimately, our most vulnerable communities will be most negatively affected by climate change. However, addressing these challenges presents the opportunity to take actions that transform our city by making Cape Town become more equitable and resilient while creating inclusive opportunities in a transitioning global economy. We have reached a, a defining moment in time. The climate actions we carry out now collectively as a global community will determine whether we will successfully avoid the most serious consequences of global warming. These actions will shape the lives of generations to come. The city of Cape Town recognizes our important role in the global community and the necessity to take action at the local level, at a municipal level as well. This is why in 2018 we joined the C40 Deadline 2020 program with leading cities across the world. This committed us to developing a new, more ambitious climate change action plan that aims to achieve carbon neutrality and resilience to climate impacts in line with scientific evidence. A first step was to define strategic direction through the city's recent adopted climate change strategy. This aligns strongly with other key city strategies such as the resilient strategy and inclusive economic growth strategy. Today we launched the action plan for the strategy. We are proud to be standing on the front line of climate action alongside a network of global cities that share the same ambitious objectives. Our plan envisions a climate resilient, resource efficient and carbon neutral city that enables inclusive economic development and healthy, thriving communities and ecosystems. What does this all mean? In Cape Town's context, this means becoming a city with well-located development, with growth that respects our beautiful environment and that enables more people to participate in society and the economy. This future city will tackle the reality of rapid urbanization, much of it informal, realistically, without losing a vision of what we can build together. Re all infrastructure and the built environment will be designed to be accessible, resilient, to the impacts of climate change and progressively lower and lower carbon until carbon neutrality is reached. The city's neutral or, or natural ecosystems must be protected, resilient and able to act as buffers to climate change impacts. On the back of, of a COVID recovery plan, economic competitiveness is maximized through clean energy resource e efficiency and a circular economy that minimizes waste. A safe, affordable, electric-powered public transport system moves citizens around in a vibrant economy. This system is complemented by walking and cycling made attractive and safe by shorter trips and dedicated infrastructure. The way forward is clear. We need to deliver an ambitious climate change action plan. And it is exactly what we're doing right now. And support improved livelihoods for our residents. Our plan recognizes and values the importance of meaningful engagement and the collective effort and ownership of climate action from all spheres of government all residents, business, and organizations. We are therefore calling on Cape Tonians to join our climate action journey. I call to act together for a stronger Cape Town. I am proud to officially launch the city of Cape Town's new 
Climate Action Plan to this diverse group of stakeholders, both here in Cape Town and also around the world. In closing, I want to particularly recognize and thank the various city departments and portfolios involved in the development and implementation of this plan. It is only through such commitment and collaboration that an ambitious transversal plan like this one can be put into action. I thank you. Another round of applause for the Alderman, Dan Plato, Executive Mayor of Cape Town, inviting us to join in on the climate action journey because we are part of that front line of action. Here is the city's invitation to you joining in in the climate action. I care about Cape Town and its people, so I'm acting against climate change. We've already experienced some of the impacts, but even our small actions can help. So let's act against climate change, for a stronger city, for water resilience, more efficient transport, for clean energy, and less waste. Let's protect our coastal areas and build a city for the future. Let's all do it. Let's act for a stronger Cape Town. And we certainly hope that you will then be joining in in that climate action journey. Thank you very much, Alderman. And thank you for your leadership of the city for uh, the time that you were mayor. Uh, we know that you will continue to be dedicated to the city of Cape Town and be a great supporter of the work that we do. Wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Well, city of Cape Town is one of the biggest cities and metros in South Africa. It's an essential part of the province of the Western Cape. So it's only apt that the premier of the Western Cape, Ellen Wendy, offers his word of support to this action plan launch. Hi, Ellen Wendy here. And a big congratulations to the city of Cape Town and the work that they are doing on climate change, the C40 team or the C40 grouping that they are part of. Uh, these are municipalities around the world that are making a difference with regards to climate change, something that we as a province really support. We know more than most uh, provinces or regions around the world that uh, our region is hard impacted by climate change by global warming. We've felt it in our bushfires. We've felt it in our droughts. Uh, again, a region that really steps up and shows the world that we can make a difference. I think we are still probably the region in the world that has shown the biggest change in behavior around water usage from a few years ago when we were due to run out of water because of one of the worst droughts we've ever experienced to halving our water usage per capita, still uh, recognized around the world as a, as a major achievement. Of course, that's only part of the work that the team are doing at C40, really making sure that uh, we are embracing and changing the way that we run our governments, the way that we influence behavior change, but also investment into making sure that we're mitigating risk of climate change. And of course, as we move forward to uh, COP26 in Scotland this year, uh, we must also submit all of these projects that we're busy with. So well done, Cape Town, uh, the mayor, uh, thank you very much for your dedication and support of this uh, really, really key program of making sure we're mitigating risk of climate change. Well done. Thank you very much indeed to the Premier of the Western Cape, Alan Windy, offering his word of support to the city and the efforts in, flight, in fighting uh, climate change uh, challenges. Um, we indicated all afternoon that uh, Cape Town is part of a network of cities that's called C40, and now we'll be um, joined live via the stream from Johannesburg by Hastings Shikoko. He is the C40 Regional Director for Africa, as well as the C40 Managing Director of Regions and Mayoral Engagement, and he's here to offer a word of support on behalf of the Chair of C40, that's the Mayor of Los Angeles, Mayor Eric Gassetti. Uh, Hastings, it's lovely to have you joining us this afternoon. I hope your weather in Joburg is nearly as beautiful as it is here in Cape Town. Thank you, Africa. It's really uh, great weather here as well. So I'm just I'm delighted to hear that it's the same in Cape Town. 
Uh, let me just start by thanking Mayor Plato and uh, Western Cape Premier Winde for the inspiring messages. Um, if you allow me, before I deliver the message from the C40 chair, I would like to give an opportunity to the C40 vice chair for Africa, another champion of climate change on the continent, and who is also the mayor of Accra in Ghana, to maybe express his uh, message of goodwill because uh, he has another commitment. So let, may I just uh, invite Mayor Ajay Sowa, C40 Vice Chair for Africa, to join us and give remarks, and then I'll continue with the remarks from Mayor Gasset. Mayor Sowa, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Hisses Chikoko, for the um, for the opportunity to speak um, on this um, August uh, occasion. The executive mayor of Cape Town, Mayor Dan Plato, members of the mayoral management committees, C40 chair Mayor Eric Cassetti, C40 managing director for regions and mayoral engagement, Mr. Hisses Chikoko. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to welcome Cape Town to join our sister cities, Durban, Accra, Dhaka, Lagos, and Johannesburg to take the bold step of publishing a detailed climate action plan to accelerate the steps towards a net zero city by 2050. Our fond memories of Cape Town, and it was one of the first cities that I visited after being sworn in as the mayor of Accra to sign a sister city agreement. This cap aims at improving collaboration and innovation for achieving a sustainable city is indeed unique on our continent. The climate action planning process of C40 indeed aids our cities to explore our actions and activities to get us into the mainstream of cities that are taking responsibility for our actions today to secure. Mayor of Cape Town, members of the Mayoral Management Committee C40 Vice Chair. Your focus on clean energy and sustainable buildings can become flagship programs that the African continent can learn from. Your cap demonstrates the pivot of innovation in inclusivity through mass transit, resource use, and misuse social housing. On such an august and historic day, I would like to, on behalf of my fellow C40 vice chairs in Africa, your sister city residents in Accra, and on my own behalf, wish you, Honorable Mayor Dan Plato, and the entire Kiptonians, a hearty congratulation and look forward to building on our work to have a sustainable future for all our citizens. Thank you and may God bless us all. Thank you so much, Mayor Soa, C40 Vice Chair for Africa, Mayor Vakra in Ghana. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to deliver a special message to Mayor Plato and uh, the city of Cape Town from Mayor Eric Gassetti of Los Angeles in the United States. Mayor Eric Gassetti is the current C40 chair and the 42nd mayor of Los Angeles, first elected in 2013 and re-elected in 2017 by the widest margin in the history of Los Angeles. He is a sustainability and resilience champion. Some of you will remember that he rallied more than 400 mayors in cities across the United States to adopt the Paris Agreement after the Trump administration pulled out of the pact. Now allow me to deliver a special message to Mayor Plato and the city of Cape Town from this great climate champion. Mayor Plato, congratulations on launching Cape Town's Climate Action Plan. Your city has always been counted 
among cities that are making bold commitments on climate change. And you have shown what it means to be a leader on the path to urban sustainability and resilience. As we prepare for COP26, the world is reminded that if we do not act quickly and together, we'll miss the window of opportunity to make substantial progress in the fight against the climate crisis. There is still a lot to be done, but C40 cities are leading the way and cities like Cape Town continue to demonstrate what is possible and what is required in this fight. I am very pleased to note that Cape Town's climate action plan has integrated climate resilience and carbon neutrality by 2050, outlining a wide range of actions to achieve this goal. It is clear that your city would like to deploy urgent climate action to deal with this crisis, whether it is through net zero carbon buildings or increasing renewable energy capacity for a transition from fossil fuel depend dependent energy or green job creation and economic development or densifying mass transit routes through mixed use developments and uh, social housing. These commitments, Mayor Plato, demonstrate Cape Town's long-term commitment to ambitious and inclusive climate action. Cape Town's climate action plan is the precedent that cities need to ensure not just a sustainable future, but a resilient one too. For Cape Town, climate resilience is essential having experienced serious water shortages a few years ago and the fire disasters recently. I'm not surprised that water security and fire control have been included in your climate action plan, demonstrating to the world that climate hazards facing our cities today require a clear climate change strategy, an evidence-based action plan, resolute leadership and inclusive stakeholder engagement. I am so delighted to count Cape Town as one of the cities that will drive the climate change agenda forward. And I congratulate you again on this incredible accomplishment. I'm proud to serve alongside leaders like you, and it gives me great confidence that we can overcome any hurdle, whether it be COVID-19 or the global climate, climate crisis, together. Eric Gassetti, C40 Chair, Mayor of Los Angeles, and thank you for your attention. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I now would like to introduce a video that was prepared together and for the city of Cape Town on their cap work under the C40 deadline 2020 climate action planning program, which Cape Town is part of. Enjoy the video and thank you so much for your attention. Cities are the hubs of human activity. How they are built affects their ability to withstand shocks and stresses like climate change. The people of Cape Town have already experienced a serious climate change impact, a drought lasting nearly four years. Residents had to pull together and reduce Cape Town's water consumption by 50%. Through their collective action, the city narrowly avoided day zero. This achievement has shown what is possible when we work together. It demonstrates the kind of action needed to address climate change, a collective response across the city to take action now for a stronger Cape Town. For us, it's about protecting our most vulnerable residents. That's the first important priority. And also securing our infrastructure by building better. So the number of important areas that we have developed, uh, firstly through the production of our climate change strategy, building on the success of our climate change policy, and then of late, the climate change action plan, which sets out a number of measures to prepare for both the risks associated with climate change by increasing climate resilience, but also by reducing greenhouse gas emissions to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. We're also doing whatever possible to transition to a green economy as a way of stimulating growth 
within the sector, both in the city and in the province. Cape Town is located in a unique biodiversity hotspot, the Cape Floristic Region, and is surrounded by ocean. This position makes the community's environment and economy vulnerable to climate hazards. Building climate resilience and protecting vulnerable residents and the local economy is critical to the city's response. The city is committed to taking proactive action to respond to the impacts of climate change. This includes addressing extreme heat, coastal risk and sea level rise, fire risk, flooding and drought. The Cape Town Water Strategy has been one of the key recent responses and provides a roadmap towards a future in which there will be sufficient water for all. If one considers the role that energy efficiency has played, one can go back to 2007 when we first started experiencing load shedding. And the way in which we mitigated that impact was through energy efficiency interventions. And as we say, the cleanest megawatt that can be produced is the one we don't produce. A big contributor from our side will therefore be to focus on global competitive local economies. So being able to offer carbon neutral goods and services, that's a big highlight for us. Also, it's about increasing energy security, and I mentioned the impact that load shedding has had. And so the role that energy efficiency plays, of course, is to help reduce the demand, but at the same time, building towards the introduction of cleaner energy, renewable energy that is provided from a diverse and additional source of generation. Also very important is the large contribution that comes from the transport sector. So for us, it's also being able to set up our transport system to be powered by clean electricity, and helping to also reduce demand for those services um, by providing for a diverse array of public transport options. The city's climate change action plan sets us on a journey towards a new future where as a city we lead by example and where we call on our residents, civil society organizations and businesses to collectively work towards a more inclusive, climate resilient and carbon neutral city. To get started, visit www.capetown.gov.za forward slash climate change. And we certainly hope that you will get started sooner rather than later because it is our collective responsibility to make sure that this uh, launch, this action plan that we're launching today becomes a reality for the city of Cape Town. Thank you very much, of course, to uh, Mayor Soa um, from Ghana in Accra. Uh, he's the C40 Vice Chair for Africa. Thank you for your lovely, wonderful message of support. And thank you to Hastings Shikoko, who is the C40 Regional Director, as well as the C40 Managing Director for Regions and Mayoral Engagement, for delivering the message from the Chair of C40 Internationally. That's the Mayor of Los Angeles. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor Eric Gassetti. Uh, thank you very much indeed. A round of applause for all those messages. Uh, we have 125 people and counting who are joining us virtually uh, as part of this uh, launch. And of course, we have a full room here at uh, this incredible venue just next to the uh, urban uh, uh, park in Greenpoint in Cape Town. Um, that is a smart living education center. Uh, do come and visit it. They have some wonderful work here uh, that they would more than happily engage and share with you. And at times, you would see uh, Nicoline Lowe, who is our graphic uh, harvester, who is listening and following, of course, the uh, proceedings of this event and capturing it uh, quite magically, in fact. Um, and it's beautiful. And I'm sure that once that picture is uh, completed, it will be hung somewhere prominently and with pride. Uh, so thank you very much, Nicolene, for uh, joining us here. In a moment, we'll be hearing from the Executive Director for Energy and Climate Change for the City of Cape Town, that's Kadri Nasip, uh, who will be sharing with us the details of this action plan. But before that, um, emerging spoken word artist who celebrates language and culture in original and compelling ways. She's a poet, she's a storyteller, she writes in Afrikaans, in English, in Colombian Spanish. She she explores issues of womanhood, of personal identity, gender issues, life and love, and today exploring the issues of climate change. Please welcome to the stage Skylar Derrington. Derrington, Derrington.
the world-renowned author J.K. Rowling said, We do not need magic to change the world. We carry all the power we need inside ourselves already. We have the power to imagine better. You see, change starts with me. I excitedly embrace and nurture my environment that brings me so much joy. I arise daily in gratitude for how well Mother Nature takes care of us. She is our inter infinite provider, the divine giver of life. She has blessed us with water, the elixir of purity and restoration. We are also fortunate enough to live on fruitful soil. The fantastic four seasons bring us ample gifts that we simply have to divide amongst each other, then multiply. Today, I would like to gift you with a seed. A seed that feeds millions when watered, sustained and shared. It's such a powerful force in such a small object, but over time, it increases in size. It provides nutrients to many mouths and it becomes a prosperous and renewable energy in many areas of our lives. The seed is action. Action for change. Let's be seeds and bloom fiercely wherever we are planted. Let's become fruit-bearing trees and flowers that beautify our surroundings and decorate our path ahead. Let's enjoy fruits of resilience, inclusivity and sustainability. Let's breathe in compassion, hope, health and personal well-being. Let's participate and collaborate with the winds of opportunity and transformation. Let's pass in our glory as a green society and grow from strength to strength. Let's thank the local rivers, dams and oceans by keeping them clean. Let's travel light and safe and dispose of waste honorably. Let's encourage one another to form walking buses for our children so that they may interact with and explore the environment and immediate surroundings. Teach them to protect and preserve. Children learn so much from tasting, touching and seeing, so why not start a family garden with them and build them an endless supply of entertainment with environmental education as their foundation. Let's have neighborhood potlucks for the elderly and offer or exchange our produce locally to soup kitchens, to churches and mosques, to schools and hospitals. Can you see how changing for the better has improved me for the betterment of society? Do you notice how starting small and thinking big becomes revolutionary? Do you realize the priceless gift we've been given here today? Let's channel the energy of the sun as we ride this wave of sustainable and renewable energy toward carbon neutrality in this beautiful country of Mzanzi, Africa. Let's all act together for change. Well done. Another round of applause, please, for Skylar Derrigan.
Let's all act together for change. Let's be seeds and bloom fiercely wherever we are planted. Skylar, thank you very much for those wonderful words of inspiration. To now introduce uh, the detail around the action plan that we are launching today, please welcome from the city of Cape Town, the Executive Director for Energy and Climate, Mr. Kadri Nasib. Right, good afternoon everybody. Um, Program Director, you've done such a marvelous job in introducing all the distinguished guests, so I'm pleasantly uh, surprised to see that I don't have to say anything other than, hey, all protocol observed. Um, I think it's such an important occasion for us as the city of Cape Town, and one would think that when you mention the word launch, you're talking about something new. And in this context, we're not talking about something new, we're talking about a journey that has been 20 years in the making that has culminated in the production of this Climate Change Action Plan. And one of the things that I'm very grateful for, apart from the virtual audience that has joined us, is the physical presence today of so many key stakeholders that have contributed towards the success so far in the city and, of course, helping us build up towards this plan. I'm very grateful, of course, for the political support that has come from within the city as well as from province and elsewhere to ensure that today is a reality. So in the course of this presentation, it's my pleasure to take you through some of the key elements of the Climate Change Action Plan. The summary document that you have, I think, encapsulates most of what I'll be saying today. Um, but certainly from my perspective, I would like to highlight a few areas that I think uh, will be of interest to you. And first of all, I think one needs to understand what the motivation is behind the production of such a plan. And I think it starts off very much on a local level and looking at the responsiveness of a city such as Cape Town, which prides itself on being an opportunity city, a caring city, an inclusive city, and certainly one that strives to be at the forefront of being a responsible corporate citizen. And so from a local perspective, looking at the challenges that we've faced, nearly reaching day zero, looking at increases in temperature and the effect that it has on our communities, looking at energy security of supply and the contribution that carbon uh, based fuels have had on emissions within this country and noting that we have a responsibility to address that and try and reverse those impacts. So from a local perspective, I think we have a very strong base from which to work in support of such a, a, an action plan. I think also very importantly is that we need to build on the success of the climate change strategy which was also released during the course of this year. That of course builds on the, the, the climate change policy that has been in place. And we've now taken it a step further in the essence of saying, well, from a policy, we want clear guidelines, we want clear strategic direction, and from that, we want concrete actions that are going to be implemented, not only by ourselves uh, in the city, but also by the various stakeholders that participate uh, in this type of environment with us. Also very importantly, at a national level, uh, we are a, a key role player in the development of, of policy at the local government level. We're also very keenly anticipating the uh, promulgation at some stage of the Climate Change Bill. And that bill is in fact a framework act that's designed to pull together various pieces of legislation that are actually going to support the more rapid introduction of measures designed to combat the impacts of climate change. And I think we're all aware of the, the sixth assessment report of IPCC, noting of course that the current course that we're on is not sufficient for us to meet the, the Paris Accord Agreement in terms of targets that have been set. So for us, it's becoming more and more vital that we play our role as a responsible local government entity, but also looking at the national perspective. And then of course, translating that into an international perspective as well, where I think urgency um, is very much at the forefront of all of our efforts. In fact, uh, I remember at the, um, at the last mayoral summit, the C40 mayoral summit, uh, Mayor Garcetti actually had to leave because of wildfires in, in Los Angeles. So this is the very real impact that this is having on day-to-day -day operations within our cities. So as I've mentioned to you, you know, this has been a journey that's been in the making for about 20 years, but one of the key milestones has been in about 2006 when we produced our first energy and climate change strategy. So along the way, what we're trying to do is to build up a, a history, a platform, a knowledge base 
that talks to the activities that have already been implemented and those that are still to come. What we, what we rely on, of course, is the evidence base uh, to, to actually produce the data sets, the modeling that goes into all of this work. So a lot of, a lot of detail sits behind what you would see today in terms of the plan, and that has to be acknowledged in terms of where it comes from. Very key is, of course, the engagement that takes place within the city itself, internally and externally. Very grateful that my colleagues are, are here, Norwandle, Mike, Dalian. Um, they will be playing a critical role in the implementation of the action plan in their respective directorates. So for us, looking at where we're going to concentrate our efforts, when you consider what contributes the most towards emissions within the city, the number one culprit is transport. And then, of course, we have a significant contribution coming in from the commercial and residential space. So it's not surprising that a lot of our efforts will be tailored towards interventions uh, in, in those spaces. What we've tried to do is to balance the production of uh, the, the plan in terms of the actual activities. We've tried to balance them between new concepts, so trying out new innovative ideas that we think are going to make a contribution, and balancing that with some of those existing programs that we know are actually tried and tested. And then from there, of course, look at some of the new areas where a lot of work has gone into the planning already. So it comes up with a whole blended approach that says, we have a very good feel for what can be done in the space of time that we'd like to. And we'll talk about some of those deadlines as we go forward in the presentation. But also what's quite key for us is, you know, the type of investment that's going to be required in order to make this a reality. And for us, there's going to be a significant contribution in terms of infrastructure and assets. And I know particularly in the transport space, we'll be looking at making significant investment on the water side and even on the energy side and I'm sure no one there as we go forward, as we plan towards uh, spatial planning that takes into account urban form, that we'll be looking more and more at uh, higher investment into this area as well. So for us, there's going to be a significant contribution in that space, touching on other areas, which includes the planning and visioning to make sure that we have adequate direction that is afforded to the city. And then also very importantly is the behavioral change and Skylar mentioned it earlier as well, it starts with us individually in terms of driving this change. So we're very excited about the opportunity of becoming individually and collectively a part of the change going forward. In terms of the actual plan, it's made up of 10 strategic focus areas. Um, the first five of them are, are, are tailored towards meeting adaptation needs, adapting to the impacts of climate change, while the next, the next five talk more to the mitigation space and helping to reduce uh, the actual emissions that come from uh, greenhouse gas emitting sources. So from that perspective, we have then tailored our plan to meet the needs of both adaptation and mitigation. The vision that we've adopted, and it was on the video earlier, but I'll just repeat it because it is quite important for us as a city. The vision that we have for this particular plan and the strategy is that we become a climate resilient and resource efficient and carbon neutral city that enables inclusive economic development and healthy, thriving communities and ecosystems. So this is very, we're very passionate about this and you'll see this coming through in the actual uh, uh, specific pro project areas that we're going to cover. There are also a number of, of cross-cutting areas and we'll be talking about some of these cross-cutting work areas in the course of the presentation. A lot of work has gone into compiling the strategic focus areas and it builds on successes already in place. So when we start talking about the, the adaptation ones, I will be giving you some examples of where there have been some notable successes already. So it gives you a feel of where the city will be active, where other stakeholders will be active, and what we hope to achieve from that as well, of course. So just a small selection of what has been done already on the adaptation side. First and foremost, looking at developing a network of cooling centers, particularly in light of increased temperatures that we've been experiencing and obviously creating an opportunity to assist our communities that are more vulnerable in respect of that heating effect as well. One of the important contributions, of course, will be the planting of trees, and that's in an effort to prevent or well, reduce the impact of what we call the heat island effect with the growing densification of buildings as well as the construction of roads you'll find that the average temperature increase within cities goes up quite dramatically, in fact, up to five degrees Celsius in some cases. This is perhaps noticeable in, in, in cities like Dubai, where they've had a significant increase in temperature within the city. So for us, one of the key ways of combating that is, of course, through planting more and more trees 
And so for us, that has become one of the key priority areas that we will be uh, focusing on going forward. Water conservation, of course, is critical given the aftermath of day zero. And as we are well aware, it's only because of the response that we got from communities that we were actually able to uh, avoid day zero. Notwithstanding the augmentation measures that were put in place by Mike and team, I think it relied heavily on the contribution that would come from the communities in order to make that a reality. So we need to build on that. We need to make sure that the lessons learned during the drought are carried forward and that we don't revert back to the behavior that helped get us in that mess in the first place. As I've mentioned to you, not just on the water conservation side, but very importantly would be our augmentation measures that would include aquifers, the desalination plants, uh, capturing of runoff water, etc. And these are all activities that our, our water and waste colleagues are busy with and their water strategy, for example, talks heavily to this type of initiative. So one of the key things I must point out to you is that a lot of the things that you'll see here are really built into the strategic plans as well as the budgets of our directorates already. So this is not something conceptual and new that's going to take years for us to be able to implement and roll out. This is based heavily on current uh, workloads and current trajectories that we're on. Another important area, considering the impact that invasive vegetation has in terms of stripping out water, groundwater, um, there are quite a few programs that are already running. The city is quite heavily involved in some of them, particularly in some of our water supply catchment areas. And there's, of course, an opportunity to partner with, let's say, working for water in the utilization of that invasive vegetation afterwards. So really a great opportunity to, as I said, strip out the invasives and also do something practical and useful uh, with the resultant biomass that's produced. Coastal erosion, of course, is a major concern for the city of Cape Town. Just take a close look at Milneton, parts of it near the Atlantic uh, Golf Course, and you'll start to see the impact that uh, coastal erosion is having on our coastline. Of course, with the growing urbanization, it has a further effect of reducing the impact that our normal coastal defenses would have in terms of protecting our, our communities. So from that perspective, um, this is a very important area for us to have a decision framework in place that will help us ultimately put in place better defenses. On to mitigation now, and I'm also going to take you through some examples very quickly uh, that will just highlight to you some of the key areas where we already have some activities in place. On the human settlement side, particularly looking at the urban form and looking at inclusivity, the idea here is, of course, that uh, looking at apartheid, apartheid style uh, planning, spatial planning, where now we find communities that have to spend a disproportionate amount of the income on transport and are also located in houses that are anything but energy efficient and designed for resilience in the face of a changing climate. So for us, the planning and the development of, of, of uh, housing solutions becomes a critical objective uh, in this particular area. A very important uh, contribution, of course, looking at energy security of supply is the, the notion of introducing more and more renewable energies and a consequent roadmap <coughs> excuse me, to go with that. Um, but it's not just about energy efficiency and, and renewable energy. It's about ultimately producing a green economy that builds on local content and looks at the green economy as a whole. So we'll be expanding not just the, the, the use of uh, renewable energy technologies, but also looking at the inclusivity elements in terms of industrialization as well as procurement within the city to ensure that we also play our part in securing the right kind of technologies going forward. Very importantly for us as well is the, the notion around communications, particularly on energy efficiency. Uh, in the video I did mention as well that in 2007 we were driving a campaign nationally to get people to reduce demand in order to avoid load shedding. So that message should still stay in the background. I mean the current threat around load shedding is not because of um, the, the high demand, it's because of a lack of availability of plant, but energy efficiency will always contribute towards reducing the likelihood and the threat from, from load shedding. So we will continue to actively uh, promote this, bearing in mind, of course, that energy efficiency helps us to also avoid new generation of any kind, which I think is always preferred in any case because it's a big investment decision that comes with that. And of course, there are timelines and commitments that come with that. So for us, we will continue to, to drive a program around promoting energy efficiency. Also net zero carbon, and this is one of the key areas for us, we are now heavily moving towards an environment in which as part of our C40 commitments, 
we are looking towards uh, net zero carbon status for municipal buildings by 2030. And that, of course, uh, fits in well with the carbon neutral um, target for 2050, uh, which we are, we are, of course, trying to uh, ensure that we reach. So from that perspective, we are leading by example, and this will culminate in another 30 megawatts of power having to be generated to supply our buildings and a net uh, reduction, a further reduction in energy consumption by 20% in order to get us uh, to this particular point. Something that my colleague Delian Campbell is busy with right now, of course, is the expansion on uh, phase two of the, uh, of the My City uh, program. And if you look at the BRT scheme in Cape Town, it has been so far remarkably successful in terms of the utilization of such a scheme. Of course, the opportunity now exists to consider alternative propulsion systems, and I'm, I'm very grateful that Delian shares the same views in terms of where we should be going in respect of public transport in the city. So whether it's going to be on the my city side, whether it's on the rail side, or whether it's non-motorized, I think the city is going to be at the forefront of, of developments nationally in respect of, of transforming our public transport schemes in the city. Another important area for us, looking at uh, particularly uh, the vehicles within the fleet of the city, and then from there on, of course, extending that into the broader market is the uptake of electromobility options for freight and for personal passenger transport. Uh, we've been working very closely already with uh, organizations such as Unido and having put up two um, uh, public charging stations for electric vehicles that are now available free of charge uh, to be used by, by uh, anyone with an electric vehicle within the city of Cape Town and can reach um, the two facilities with charging infrastructure. So this is the start of a process. It will obviously culminate in the rollout, the further rollout of electric vehicles. Uh, not too long ago, we purchased five electric vehicles and we'll be hoping to expand on that number pretty soon as we go forward. <coughs> What's very important also from the perspective of the uh, circular economy is the notion of maximizing the diversion of garden and food waste. So for us, um, the circular economy represents not just an opportunity to remove waste, prevent landfilling, but also creates an opportunity for sustainable job creation, which I think is going to become even more of an issue as we go forward. So there are a number of cross-cutting areas, and those areas are listed for you. Uh, most importantly, for example, you'll have mainstream in governance, research, and knowledge management that talks to being able to ensure that across organizations we have the same message, we work off the same knowledge management base, and we're able to effectively research and produce the type of innovative solutions that we need. Also, the economic impacts and green economy opportunities need to be studied. Uh, earlier, I think we had Alderman James Foss with us. I'm not sure if he's still here but certainly he is spearheading the initiative to try and produce the opportunities within industry for the private sector to participate in. And we see the Atlantis SEZ as also a, ph a phenomenal opportunity to try and push the, the role of renewable energies in that particular space. There are some more ones in terms of communication. There's also protecting human and ecosystems. So there's a number of these cross-cutting areas that we think are going to be pivotal in order for the plan to be implemented. So. We just want to stress for you, I think, the notion that this is transversal and it's going to rely on a number of key stakeholders to make this happen. So just in terms of some of the key cross-cutting areas that have been undertaken already and are in the process, one of the areas we'd like to focus on is facilitating investment into the local green economy. As I said to you earlier, it's not just about building renewable energy plants, it's about trans transferring skills, technology into the local economy for the benefit of the city and the province at the same time. So for us, we're going to be working very carefully with industry and other stakeholders in ensuring that this does happen. Looking also then at mainstreaming implementation of climate responsive and sustainable procurement. I've mentioned this to you before, ensuring that the items that we procure, even vehicles, are procured in a manner which is sustainable and also talks to the longer term goals about reducing their impact on the environment. So this is becoming even more pronounced now. I think we had some very good successes when we motivated for the five electric vehicles because it gave us an opportunity to test this. And so from there we found that you can make an economic argument on for green procurement. And even though that's not the ideal scenario, we should be looking at the more strategic long-term framework. We are finding more and more renewable energies, electric vehicles, 
have come into their own and are making good business cases themselves. Also very critical, as I said to you, is the notion around jobs, and green jobs, of course, is a critical element of that. So from our perspective, we'd be looking more and more at how do we integrate climate resilience, integrating job opportunities, and so far there have been some very good successes, particularly with EPWP. We have been able to utilize them more, more, more and more in terms of dune protection and other areas uh, where we found opportunities for them. And Councillor Solelo is, of course, here today with us but very importantly is the communication plan and education plan that comes with that. This is a partnership. It's a partnership between ourselves, industry, the residential consumers, etc. So we need to educate them as well in terms of what their ex own expectations are and how they can deliver against those expectations. And we provide the tools. There are some good smart living guides that have been produced as well out of the Let's Act campaign. And we're finding that to be very useful in educating uh, some of our community members in terms of outreach. And then also just to look at somewhere with this green infrastructure program, looking at climate change responses, being able to identify where those impacts are and being able to develop appropriate solutions based on what those identified impacts are. So in terms of implementing the plan, what are the key issues that we need to take cognizance of in order to make sure that this plan is implementable and achieves the results that we've set? It needs to be cyclically reviewed. So that's going to be a critical component for us, is ensuring that we have these periodic reviews and updates that will keep it relevant. Also at the same time, it has to be backed up by an appropriate monitoring and evaluation system and process to, in order to learn from the mistakes or the successes uh, out of the implementation. It's only by doing the cycle of learning that we are able to feed back some of those lessons back into planning to ensure that our plans stay up to date and relevant in the context of what we're trying to achieve. One of the key things, of course, is making sure that we have the relevant skilled professionals and making sure that we have the adequate teams in place. And I'm very fortunate that we have, under Leila Mohamed Vidman, a very skilled team supported by Green Cape, SEA, Province, etc. So this has been a phenomenal team effort. I, I must just point that out uh, to you. And then, of course, number three, some of the key steps are highlighted to you in the graphic on the right, which I won't go through. But what are the key priorities that are being supported by the plan? And we've listed some of these key priorities for you. I'm not going to go through all of them. Touching on just a few of the key ones, energy security of supply, very critical for us at this point in time. Looking at community resilience and being able to ensure that our communities don't suffer further from their vulnerability uh, to climate change. Also looking at energy poverty alleviation as being one of the key limiting factors in the development uh, of our communities. Along the way, ma managing our wastewater systems more effectively, uh, being able to also look at coastal resilience, and I've mentioned that to you. And then obviously on the water side, being able to ensure that we manage our resources more effectively and plan ahead for the sustainable utilization of water going forward. So this is just a snapshot of what our key priorities are in that space. What is needed, and I've mentioned this time, uh, time and time again, is this collaborative approach that is needed to climate change. So it's not just about the city. It's about the partnership that we are forming, and we're very happy to have some of those key stakeholders here. So, for example, it's not just us. It's civil society, academia, government, residences, businesses, international partners, and some of those partners are here with us. So they're holding our hands as we go through this entire process. Without them, we cannot do this. So this is, for us, I think, the key enabler to ensure that this plan is a reality. The campaign that I mentioned to you earlier talks to this. It's the Let's Act campaign. It's our umbrella campaign, which is designed to look at our climate change response. And it was launched quite successfully uh, earlier this year. And what it does is it actually helps us to build that relationship with our other stakeholders. And as part of that outreach, we've been able to put together some, some very good smart living guides, uh, which are now in widespread circulation. Of course, along the way, we are partnering with the likes of C40 and other organizations worldwide, so we have that access to expertise at a global level, which I think is already starting to show very good results. And just in closing, just to note, of course, that the documentation that you have with you today is also available online, and the site has been given to you in terms of the link. I invite you to go and study it further. I invite you to comment further, and I invite you to be a part of the implementation of such an exciting plan, which is not just in the interest of the city, but I think for the entire region and for the continent. Thank you so much. Another round of applause, please, for the Executive Director for Energy and Climate Change in the City of Cape Town, Mr. Kadri 
uh, Nasib. That was very much a high level um, summary, if you like, of what is a very detailed document, uh, which, as you said, uh, Kadri, it wasn't only the city of Cape Town who was working on it, but a number of partners who obviously were contributing to it. Um, we're going to hear now from two speakers. The one is Megan Houston Brown, who's a director for Sustainable Energy Africa. Uh, she'll be followed by uh, Manfred Braun, who's a director of environmental sustainability at UCT, in fact, employed in the office of the vice chancellor. Both the individuals are going to be responding now to the uh, action plan and hopefully inviting you to engage with it in uh, seeking opportunities, obviously, uh, that you can explore in not only saving us from the devastating impact of climate change, but more importantly, uh, creating perhaps the jobs that can be realized here. What I like from Kadri's uh, talk is the fact that a lot of these workloads are already in place. The budgeting has been set aside for this to be realized, um, that there are green jobs being created and uh, job opportunities there. And obviously, periodic reviews are important. Otherwise, how are we going to know whether what we're doing is good or not? Uh, Megan, you go up first. Uh, love to hear your thoughts on uh, the presentation there by uh, the city. Thank you. Oh, my notes have all melted. <laughs> um, I'd like to obviously acknowledge the Honourable Mayors in the room and outside of the room um, and other distinguished guests, but otherwise I'm going to say all protocol observed. Um, I'm from Sustainable Energy Africa, and, and Kadri mentioned the long journey, uh, the sort of 20-year journey, really, that the, the city has um, undergone in terms of climate work. Um, and we've been part of that uh, as a not-for-profit organization. We've also been quite a big uh, part of the C40 program in Africa, um, providing technical support to the other cities uh, developing climate action plans. So it's a great honor to be here today. And I think the most distinguished guests are really the team, that big team Kadri referred to, um, who put together this uh, really fantastic report. So a huge congratulations to you there. Um, when I was sort of thinking how, how to come into this talk, I, I spoke to my children, actually, and I said to my daughter, well, what's the sort of in here? And she said to me, she's 22 and she's a student, um, suffered the sort of lockdown, uh, feeling bit, bit bitter and angry with the world. And she said, we need to know what to do. Um, I, I think I won't say what my son said. He said, it's pretty gnarly, mom. <laughs> so <laughs> my daughter was a little more helpful. But, but when she said that, it made me think, you know, I, I haven't recently thought about what do people think about climate change out there. And um, I looked it up using Google, uh, my son not having been hugely useful. And... Um, what you find is that 90% that of people, you know, this is a recent global survey uh, reported on by Forbes, 90% of people globally believe the climate is changing. And most people believe that it is going to destroy the global economy, that our cities are going to be flooded, uh, that we are going to see mass migration, and that there's a very high likelihood of regional wars. So, so people feel pretty helpless. And I think... More importantly, the youth in particular feel incredibly helpless. Um, another recent global survey points to around 75% of youth feeling deeply frightened about the future, and it affects them on a daily basis. It's not sort of something remote. And something very interesting to me was that this concern is expressed more deeply in the global south. And I thought that was of, of great interest and significance for uh, the city of Cape Town. And we, you know, we sort of know it in the blunt words of Greta Thunberg, but, but the youth feel that there is blah, blah, blah. They feel abandoned. They feel almost betrayed and very, very confused by government's failure to act uh, uh, in response to this in impending crisis. And I, and I really want to just talk about the importance of the Cape Town Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan in this context. Uh, and then I'm going to go on to sort of talking about how I think or, or what I think needs to happen for this action plan to become a rallying point and then give you a glimpse into what this kind of complex change looks like. So, so in that context, an action plan is, is really invaluable. You know, we, we can I can take this to my daughter and I can say, there you go, there's an action plan, there's something to, to be done. So, so that's hugely commendable. 
In, in terms of, of looking at what is needed to take this plan uh, from just being a plan with a tremendous amount of hard work that the city's laid out for itself to do into something that's a rallying point uh, beyond the city, uh, and I'm, I mean the city administration there, I think there are three key things that I would just like to touch on in terms of doing that. I, th I think we all need to know that it matters, that these actions matter. Uh, I believe very strongly that we need to see that this action plan is addressing social exclusion. And then lastly, I think it needs to demonstrate a new approach to governance. So I'm gonna just talk about all three of those uh, uh, quite briefly. So, so starting with the, the idea that it matters. So, so one of the things that my sister said, and it came out in these youth, my, my daughter, it came out in the, in the surveys, is this feeling that nothing that they do matters. Nothing, you know, how do we shift? This is just so overwhelming. Uh, does it matter? And um, I think even within the city, there's sometimes a feeling of, uh, Cape Town is only 0.1% of global emissions, South Africa is only 1% of global emissions, does it matter? And, and I'm gonna start there with, you know, the kind of technical support that we've provided to the city and other cities in terms of uh, building the pathways to carbon neutrality. And I can see Priscilla shaking her head here. She deals a lot with data. Every single action is required if we are going to meet carbon neutrality. It's a bit like a bird building a nest. Every single twig is needed there. There is no silver bullet. There is no you know, great big solar power station in the Northern Cape that's going to come and, and solve everything. And, and that's partly because this is not just a climate crisis in terms of emissions, it's also a resource crisis. More broadly, uh, this is just the, the most immediate of those crises. So believe me, every single action does matter. Um, the other thing I wanted to just say to people is, you know, I myself uh, started out often saying, oh, we're 1% of global emissions, you know, what does it matter? And I'd like to ask you just mentally in your heads to answer my question here. How much do you think the UK contributes to global emissions? Sort of write it down mentally. And then I'm gonna ask you how much do you think uh, a huge economy like Germany contributes to global emissions? Germany, just to give it some perspective, um, I think the, the German economy, I think the, the entire African continent's economies added up um, and doubled would sort of equal the German economy. So just to say that the UK is 1% of global um, emissions, same as South Africa, so is France, uh, so is Australia. And, and Germany, with its absolutely colossal economy, is 2% of global emissions. So there is absolutely no luxury of saying that our contribution doesn't matter. That we've, we've really got to put that to bed. And then lastly, on why it matters, I also wanted to draw on Mayor Sauer's um, introduction. This doesn't just matter for Cape Town. You know, Cape Town joins all of the C40 cities globally, making a stand for cities. But I think even more importantly, it joins the sisterhood of African cities. And in that space, Africa is a, a very under-resourced continent. We're low on uh, skills, we're low on resources. And our sisterhood, uh, our reaching out to each other really matters. It matters in getting our voices heard, and it matters in sharing the, the knowledge and skills as, as Mayor Sauer acknowledged. And the city of Cape Town plays a very, very important role in that and has over many, many years. So, so that's why this, this, this plan matters. And I think we really need to be convinced by and about that. The, the, the second um, part then is this issue of inclusion and justice. I think that, um, you know, the, the sort of rallying cry of the social movements and particularly the youth is that there's no climate justice without social and economic justice more broadly. Um, and in fact, there's a, a, a lovely phrase by um, Ayaka Melitafa, who was a, a, a climate activist that emerged in Cape Town during the drought. And, and she said, yes, we're all in this together, but the wrath is felt more by the poor. Um, and when it comes to floods and when it comes to drought, it's the poor who have far less resilience to adapt. Uh, so, so, you know, the, the, the challenge to the city is really to use this plan to, to really grab the heart of uh, social exclusion, the heart of inequality in the city. Um, and in fact, Lord Stern, who's the big climate economist, says that green infrastructure in cities in the developing world is the growth story of the future. So there's an enormous opportunity here. 
and how that opportunity is seized um, in terms of addressing a social justice is, is really important. So, so we look forward to seeing that. In, in fact, what would be really fun and, and amazing would be to see the climate action plan of the city being, in a sense, the sort of radical engine of the, the city's plan going forward. And then the, the third aspect, I think, that is really important in, in terms of making this plan a rallying point for climate action for everybody is the issue of governance. And, and you know, you're really looking to a whole of governance approach. I think Kadri talked about this quite a lot. But I wanted to talk about two concepts here. And, and the one is this notion of subsidiarity. And in fact, I was in a room with Leila when we first heard this word subsidiarity. But it's a legal principle. Um, and it, it really means that governance should happen closest to where people are. Um, and it protects the right of local government in our constitution. Um, and it, it says that that really matters and as much that can come down to the local level should. But it also speaks to um, governance at a street committee level, at a ward committee level. Um, and I think we saw a lot of that happening both in COVID and in the drought, the sort of emergence of very local structures uh, to manage and support things. And, and often in cities, there's, there's this sort of issue of, of mandates. And I, I wanted to speak about subsidiarity as an important principle because one of the things it also says is that where things are governed should be more a matter of principle than a matter of politics. Um, and just a bit of experience here, when, when we started out of this work, sort of thinking back to kind of 2005, and again, I'm, I'm looking at Leila, who's a colleague then, you know, we met a sort of closed arm response from many of the, particularly the electricity departments in cities, saying, this is not our mandate. Sustainable energy, energy transition, not our mandate. Um, and now in our cities, we see grids that are open to small-scale embedded generation. The city of Cape Town, whereas Mary has got something plus 41 um, megawatts of, of local small-scale embedded generation on the grid. And, and I think now those same people would feel very silly if they were still having their arms closed and saying, it's not our mandate. And, and, and mandates really are functions. It's when the ground changes and climate change is, is, is leading to rapid technology change. Uh, there will be changes, and we have to govern very, very dynamically in that space. So that's one element of governance. The other element is, uh, and uh, this is thanks to Adrian and Lysander here, this concept of levers, and it's in the topic title today. Uh, the city is this very, very important site of delivery for climate change because it deals with urban infrastructure, it deals with service delivery, the things that really drive emissions, uh, that drive people's resilience, that drives the ability of the city to adapt, to absorb climate impacts. But they can't deliver this kind of ambition on their own. There's absolutely no way. But what cities do have is, is a number of levers. And uh, levers, I, I saw that the original, it, it comes from the Latin word, which means light. Um, and, and really what a lever does is it, uh, you know, it takes a small amount of force to lift a large amount of load. So the city um, has these levers. The levers are both the mandates that it has uh, as well as the regulatory powers that it's got. So it can regulate, it can raise taxes, it's got a budget, it can spend money, uh, it can engage citizenry, it can do all of those things uh, within those specific mandates that it has. So, so really this plan needs to be the you know, almost the pivot on which those, those levers take place, uh, lifting that, that heavier load of, of the city. So, so what does this look like? Um, I, I want this, uh, you know, uh, to give a sense of sort of almost the, the messiness of what it looks like and a sense of what the city is already managing and is already put into action because often it's fairly invisible because it's so systemic. And I thought I'd go into this by taking the mandate of spatial planning. So cities, um, that's a very clear mandate for cities. Uh, uh, Kadri touched on this as well. You know, cities are required to look far into the future and to say over time, um, what, what are we gonna use for what? And it's an important lever. Um, appropriate spatial planning, appropriate densification can halve emissions. So in rapidly growing cities, this is, is really a critical climate change lever. 
But there are many things that then spread out from that. So, uh, and I've got this wonderful, messy diagram that I really should probably have uh, put up for you. Uh, I think on the adaptation side, you know, wh when you do spatial planning, you're trying to balance the, the demands of housing people immediately uh, with the medium-term demands of uh, an economy based on tourism and natural resources and with the very long-term demands that don't fit into a human scale of nature and of the, the really critical resources that we are so dependent on um, as climate change um, accelerates. So, so those have to be balanced by the city, and that's not an easy balance, and everyone uh, shouts. In fact, nature's the one that shouts the least, but when it does, it, it's quite um, violent in its shouting. But, but with spatial planning, I think what's so, so exciting to see is that the city of Cape Town developed a densification policy. And people may not even know that, but if you drive along Main Road and you go through Claremont and you go through Observatory, what you see is this uh, massive growth, this densification along those transit nodes. And I'm sure it's the same up the Fort Trekker Road. And, and, and so the private sector responds and developers respond. They move into the spaces, but that's ultimately been directed by the city. Those same nodes of densification enable the city's transit, transport unit uh, to become viable, the, the utility to, to gain a degree of viability. And in both of that, there's, there's an inclusionary moment. So there's more accommodation for people in the inner city areas. There's much more mobility for people in those same areas. At the same time, the city's developing uh, through its regulatory powers, it's developing requirements for net zero carbon buildings. And, and what that does is that those developments are then taken up by the private sector. Um, the, the costs of living in those houses come down because they're more efficient. Economic opportunities open up as uh, small scale embedded generation gets put onto the roofs and people feed power back into the grid. They can feed power back into the grid because the city has enabled that uh, as it manages both access to the grid, making sure power is affordable to people People, but also this ability now for more and more people to participate in the grid. So, so what I'm trying to sort of illustrate for you is this kind of complex interplay of forces. And uh, this is really underway uh, as we speak. Um, and these are big systemic changes that ultimately lead to the kind of mass scale transformation that we're looking for. So in closing then, I wanted to just leave this optimistically to say that in terms of the global survey that um, Forbes was reporting on, they did also conclude that most people of the world feel that we are still able to avoid the worst effects of climate change, although it would need drastic changes soon in how we tackle it. And I think the climate action plan of the city that we're seeing today uh, is able to tell you what that drastic action is, and it's able to empower you uh, to take that action. So uh, a, a call to the city. This is a fantastic plan and well done. And the next step is really to uh, invite citizens to occupy that plan. And um, I think that's a good moment for me to hand over to my colleague Manfred from University of Cape Town, uh, who's doing exactly that. Thank you. to see if I'm on. Great. If, uh, good, what are we? good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation from the city um, to address all of you. Thank you to Mayor Dan Plotter for hosting us and hosting this event. And uh, welcome to all of you in the room and to all of you online as well. It's great to have you join us today. Um, I'm really excited by this action plan because um, Kadri really nicely set out some of the, the actions that are going to be coming out of this and, and I'm really excited that a lot of this is already evident in what the city is doing. Um, I'm very blessed to be a citizen of the city and to actually see some of these actions happening around me for, for a number of years already. Um, I grew up in Pretoria and moved down to, to study at UCT a couple of years back, about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, I think I just coming into back sort of in the, in the early 90s, driving into the city, um, coming down the, the highway and looking up to the university that I was going to be going to, I was very excited. And it kind of as a, sta a key stakeholder in the city, 
um, it's such a prominent university, but, but we own so much property and consume so much en energy, we're so resource intensive, and so really as a key stakeholder, we need to play our part as well. And what excites me about this plan is the let's act, and I think there's a together inferred. It's about let's act together. We're citizens in the city, we're organizations, businesses, um, we need to act together. Um, that really excites me and, and it's about how we make that happen together. And so I wanted to today just share a few examples of what we're doing as a university and how we're acting and on a similar journey. And, and we're part of the city and, and working together to achieve this. Um, let's just see if we're going. Pressing the wrong arrow helps to have it the right way around. There we go. So one of the things to, to remember is, is this incredible disparity as a city, but where about half of our citizens, just sort of over two million of our citizens are living sort of in very dire circumstances. And so as a city in a developing context, um, this is something that is so evident whenever we have severe um, weather events like floods or fires, things like that. And so that's why an action plan like this is so much more critical for a city like ours living in this context. These citizens are the ones that experienced the worst of the worst. Um, and so we as leaders need to act. And that's part of the reason why I really um, kind of wanted to foc the, focus the presentation on leaders must lead. And it really thrilled with the city's actions and the leadership that the city of Cape Town is taking in the space. And, and through kind of this, also just want to encourage others to organizations out there, citizens, um, to lead. Um, there's a great opportunity for that, especially where you have resources and for big organizations to lead. And so the University of Cape Town is one of those big organizations in the city and must lead. We must lead. We have over 200 buildings, about a, thousand, a million square meters, five campuses across the city. If you put that into market value, about 36 billion market value, many thousands of students every year and staff. And just to manage that portfolio is about a thousand staff members. So it's actually quite a big property company if you think about that, although we're not, our focus is obviously academia. Um, and then in terms of energy costs, quite a significant energy bill we have every year. Um, that just shows how resource intensive we are in the city. So we've developed uh, in the last two years a really critical strategy of our own that really talks about how we're going to be acting um, over the next 30 years. Um, our vice chancellor is really kind of supportive and a key sort of focus area of the next 10 years during her tenure is to ensure that sustainability is a key component of um, that vision. Um, by the way, I just I have added links. The city is welcome to share this presentation to sort of the detailed documents. Um, just very high level sort of overview, really just sort of in a few seconds about the strategies that it has sort of a number of shades. And I think that's some of what Megan was talking about as well is this complexity in the city and, and organizations in the city live in a complex sort of context where it's not as simple as just putting up that solar energy farm up there and that'll solve all these problems. And the University of Cape Town is no different. We have a lot of old heritage buildings and a lot of infrastructure challenges that we can't simply just change overnight. And so there's an acknowledgement that the strategy, there will be shades of green. There will be buildings that will be less green than others. There will be sort of procurement processes that take much longer to transform than others, all that kind of stuff. We need to acknowledge that. And so um, the strategy acknowledges that journey. But our ultimate intention is to be both sort of on three levels, net zero, carbon, water, and waste um, by 2050. And my view, probably waste is probably going to be the biggest challenge. Um, having seen other big organizations around the world struggle with waste, and in South Africa that's uh, one of the biggest challenges is you can't just get rid of waste. You can't just sort of hide it underground and, and continue doing what we're doing at the moment. So that's going to be an interesting one to watch. So the strategy is not uh, just sort of sucked out of thin air. 
It aligns really with our national development plan. It also um, UN global uh, COP like the Paris Agreement and then also working very closely in aligning with the C40 targets and then ultimately obviously our local context in the city. Um, our own carbon footprint context, um, quite interesting. Um, buildings, our biggest proportion over 70%. That's our big chunk uh, where most of that is due to where the energy is produced. Um, that could obviously change quite quickly if there's opportunities for buying renewable energy. Uh, but a big proportion of, of our footprint is also our travel that we do and our procurement of goods and services at about just over 20%. So annually that's about 100,000 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent uh, every year. And we need to work very hard as a key citizen in the city to reduce that uh, down to net zero about 2050. And so I think as citizens, as organizations in the city, we need to take stock of where we're at, what is our, our, our greenhouse and our carbon footprint, and act quickly and urgently. And so this is kind of sort of a, a notional idea of how we might get there and, the re and acknowledging already up front that it's probably not likely that we can reduce everything through our own infrastructure and we might have to use offsets or be, be able to purchase renewable energy. That's a reality that we acknowledge now and we need to plan for that. And I think it's great to be collaborating in inner city where this is already kind of something that's kind of on the table and being explored. So I wanted to give a couple of um, projects, some examples that might make it sort of tangible. I think obviously as an academic institution, our primary objective is to continue focus on, on research and teaching and so you might know some of the, the research institutions at UCT, but have really done over many years some, some incredible research in the space of climate change or climate modeling, um, all that kind of work that's happened. That's going to continue and will, will, will continue to grow as well. And, but, but more than that, I think some of that will contribute to our own campus sustainable sort of approach and how we, we become more, more of a sustainable campus. This is one example, the photograph of a construction site at the moment, the D School, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly, but uh, we put a, a camera on the crane there and uh, we basically made access to that camera freely available to students and anyone who wants to sort of log in and monitor the construction process. And so we kind of wanted to use the campus and the facilities as a way of, of students to be able to learn, not just in a laboratory, in a classroom, but actually through what's happening on the campus and the campus facilities. And so it becomes a living lab for sustainability in that way. So one of the other projects recently completed, um, you might have noticed that driving up the M3 is a new residence for about 500 students. Um, we developed this through sort of a turnkey project with Eris that won that tender and we um, managed to achieve a four-star green star rating, and we're about 54% more energy efficient than the SANS uh, 10400XA, which translates into about a million rand saved every year in terms of cost. So right into our bottom line as university, that's a key sort of contribution of, of projects like this, so a great opportunity. Um, one of the other things, obviously, as students living in a space like this, they have an incredible privilege of learning about green buildings, about sustainability now, living in a green building for the first time. So we produced um, this sort of illustration which looks at all the green features in their residence. Um, we've got sort of big A0 posters up all around the residence. Um, I've also put the link there as well if you're interested in having a look at that. But trying to find ways of communicating sustainability is really key. And I think that's a great attribute of the action plan as well in the city is how do you communicate this clearly so that people understand at all levels and how can they contribute um, and act as well. So the other project I mentioned was the D School. Um, that's probably the one that's most prominent at the moment under construction along the M3. You've know, seen the crane and starting to sort of look a little bit like this. Um, it's a kind of really exciting project. We're really trying to push boundaries in terms of energy efficiency and renewable energy, targeting a six-star, green-star rating, and targeting probably around about 
60 to 75 percent um, less energy consumption than SANS 10 for 100. We were aiming for net zero, but we just didn't have the, the budget support for that, unfortunately, from the donor. It just couldn't quite get there, but it's really kind of starting to push a lot of those boundaries with some exciting technologies um, that I'm happy to talk to you about afterwards, kind of shown in the image with things like cooling through the slab or heating, where it's kind of using radiant cooling instead of air conditioning, things like that. So really trying to push boundaries with technology and, and um, reduce energy consumption and greenhouse gas, gas emissions in that way. So that's that same building currently under construction. Um, yeah, so really exciting. And then one last example that I wanted to give, sort of quite different, uh, where institutions, organizations can act um, is looking at how they, where they invest their money. So um, I sit on one of the university's um, committees called the Panel for Responsible Investment, and we recently uh, put a proposal to our council that we should divest by 2030 from any fossil fuel um, companies. And I think that is just one of the actions and an example that other organizations could also kind of look at is review where you're actually putting your money and what are you investing in. And I think that, again, is an opportunity to kind of trigger other organizations to do similar things. So the way forward and, and some of the challenges. Um, this is something that Ban Ki-moon said a few years ago. We're using resources as if we had two planets. There can be no plan, uh, plan B because there is no planet B. And, and the sad reality is, is South Africa's RP is, is not yet there. But I think what stands out in the city's plan is that the city is going to be acting despite some of these national challenges that are happening and continue to drive forward the city's own uh, climate change agenda and transform more rapidly than what maybe nationally we can or, or are doing for whatever reason. And so I think that's really exciting and, and in, in, at the same time represents a challenge because the city exists in a national context and, and so there's that tension that the city will have to deal with and, and us as uh, uh, citizens. So we've got challenges ahead but we've also got opportunities. And so for the university, just some of those challenges and they're probably quite similar for the city and many other organizations. We've got major budget constraints. As a university, we've got about 32,000 different constituents pulling budgets in different directions. So how do you split that pot of money across those different needs? We've got really important heritage uh, infrastructure, beautiful old buildings, uh, but a lot of, for example, infrastructure underground that there's no documentation for and, and all sorts of challenges that how do we overcome these and typically they require more money and resources to deal with. Um, we've got quite an uh, interesting calendar to deal with and how do you actually work around that uh, when really the focus is on, on, on research and learning and how do you kind of make a lot of change when normal sort of business as usual needs to continue. Then we've also got a very sort of proudly devolved management structure that really works well, but in some cases it doesn't work well. We now want to implement a strategy across all space, and I think the city will have a similar issue. Is how do you make an action plan sort of where everyone acts in one accord when you have these big departments sort of functioning in a very devolved way? And so some great opportunities, I think. Um, there's lots of opportunity to save money on, on energy costs uh, through energy efficiency. Kadri talked about that. Also things like PV. Um, but also there's other operational cost savings. Um, for us, for example, the Jamie Shuttle, we're busy looking at that quite closely and how to convert that to electric buses. And, and that would certainly represent an operational cost saving as well. Things like that. We want to remain Africa's leading university and back to that leaders must lead. I think it's great to see the city leading uh, in the space and so we need to as leaders take responsibility and act and act quickly and a great opportunity probably the greatest is the many young minds that pass through uni the university every year is is their experience of the campus and what they learn on campus not just on their own courses and research but just through the campus environment and how you can transform a student that's coming for law or for um, whatever it might be, whatever degree they're coming for, they are being transformed through the environment that they're engaging with. And then lastly, just to highlight, um, as a number of us have mentioned already, it's collaboration is key. 
So I've just put down a couple of key partners that we collaborate with and that are part of this journey for us, but also for the city, I think. And so it's how do we work together? Let's act together um, to work on this plan with the city. So I'm going to end off with a thought from and, and words from a hero of ours. It is in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. And so Cape Town, it's in our hands. Let's do this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Manfred. Um, and I think Manfred there was showing how, as an organization, it's an academic institution, but it's a, an important citizen in Cape Town. Uh, they can work with the uh, Climate Change Action Plan that we've been launched here today to realize a difference to the world, but also, in their case, rands and cents. I mean, the amounts of money that can be saved in terms of running and maintaining of those uh, uh, buildings is actually extraordinary. So, Manfred, thank you very much for that. Megan, our daughters will rule the world one day. There's absolutely no doubt or question about it. We just need to be patient with the boys. They'll catch up. They'll catch up eventually. Now, the next person I want to introduce to you, and it is a video that he's uh, delivered to us, is Craig Foster. He's a man we celebrated with and ululated alongside when, of course, the um, uh, documentary that they produced was named the best documentary at the recent Oscar uh, award ceremony, My Octopus Teacher. He's also the founder of the Sea Change Project, and he has a wonderful uh, message of support for this action uh, plan. Cape Town and this incredible tip of Africa, False Bay, one of the greatest bays on our planet. This area is incredibly significant globally. We have one of the highest levels of biodiversity on land and in sea in the whole world. And it's really this coast of South Africa is the cradle of humankind. This is where we started to awake as a species. We have the longest relationship with nature of anywhere in the world this incredible legacy that goes deep into our prehistory. So if there's any place on Earth that we really need to protect, both for its biodiversity and its extraordinary human origins, this is it. There's no equal. Climate change, biodiversity loss, is threatening our entire planet, threatening our species and all those other wonderful species, of plants and animals that we live with. It's absolutely crucial that we all come together from all walks of life, corporate government, people on the street, and find healthy solutions so that we can keep our planet, our great mother nature alive. This biodiversity is the living immune system of our planet. It literally keeps us breathing from second to second. It's absolutely vital. And we all think of exactly how we're going to look into the next years, the next decades. They are probably the most crucial time in the history of our species. The greatest threat facing, in my mind, this planet is the cooling of the human heart towards nature. We desperately need a change of heart and we need to recognize Mother Nature as the foundation on everything. Everything rests on her beautiful broad shoulders. And they are certainly beautiful broad shoulders. Let's not allow our human hearts to cool, as Craig Foster reminds us there. And most importantly, this is the most crucial time. Well, Shamla Reed is the South Africa Country Coordinator for the upcoming UNFCCC Conference um, uh, of the Youth. Uh, and of course, they'll be talking to matters of climate change. And she's here uh, to respond, I suppose, to the action plan that has been launched here. Shamla, lovely to see you. Okay, so greetings to everyone present here today and to the participants that is joining us online. I'm Sham Lari, the South African Country Coordinator for the 16th United Nations Conference of Youth, simply known as COI 16. COI 16 is an event hosted by Yango, the official youth constituency of the UNFCCC, 
and is hailed as the most significant youth gathering for its ability to directly forward the global youth statement to the COP negotiation process. In preparation for this process, myself and my co-country coordinator, Ashna Naidu, has worked with South African universities and climate-focused youth organizations to develop the National Youth Statement, which presents young South Africans' commitments, demands, and recommendations. Some of the key areas include the transition to renewable energy and ensuring that that transition is just and fair, having access to understandable climate education, and delivering climate action that through an intersectional lens. So, in addition to developing this national use statement, I'm also one of the authors that is developing the global use statement with a specific focus on sustainable cities and communities. So with all of this said, and of, with all the input that we've received both nationally and globally, I can officially congratulate the City of Cape Town for developing a climate change strategy that reflects the voices of young people. Okay, so it is important that young people's voices are reflected in climate change policy because the implementation of that policy translates into the biggest systemic changes which ultimately decides the fate of our future. And our generation, including future generations, has the right to a cleaner, brighter, and sustainable future. And we are holding government accountable to lead and work with private sector, civil society, academia, ordinary citizens, and especially young people. Young people do not only want to be the beneficiaries of climate change policy, but we also want to be partners in its implementations and agents of positive change. Personally, I firmly believe that I need to have a hand in shaping my own future, and I need to make a difference where I come from. And I'm a Cape Townian. Cape Town is my home. I've lived in Cape Town all my life, so as my parents and some of my grandparents. My family has lived in Cape Town for roughly a century, and so, the vision for a stronger, better Cape Town resonates, and it's very important to me. And so realizing this vision is a great challenge, but it also holds great opportunity, especially the opportunity for social economic transformation. And this is one of the reasons why I'm passionate about working in the climate change space, because Addressing climate change issues translates into employment opportunities, into entrepreneurship opportunities, into investment opportunities. There's potential to connect people, to connect stakeholders. And more importantly, it addresses the root causes that actually makes people vulnerable in the first place. And so, here we have an opportunity to make Cape Town stronger and better. And as a youth member of the Youth Climate Change Advocacy Movement, my final call to you today is that we grab this opportunity and that we start working towards making that vision a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Another round of applause, please, for Shamila Reed. And now to the business end of our afternoon. In a moment, I'll be calling up the councillor, uh, Pindile Matliti, who's a mayoral committee member for energy and climate change for his concluding remarks. Uh, a couple of notices. Um, firstly, thank you very much for joining us on the virtual platform. Uh, nearly 180 of you dialed in throughout the afternoon, and it really has been uh, amazing to see and witness. We have received your comments and questions, and remember that within the next uh, week or so, uh, we will be summarizing those questions and comments and responding to them, and then making available a um, presentation copy as well as a video of what has transpired today. Please. 
please do share it as widely as possible uh, for those in your network who you feel need to know about this uh, action plan. Secondly, thank you very much to all of you who took the trouble and some of your Thursday to come and join us here uh, in, um, we are in Greenpoint, right, officially. Uh, it's not quite Three Anchor Bay, it's not Millie Point, it's Greenpoint. Uh, it really is a fantastic facility and it's, it's lovely to be here. Uh, we have some goodie bags for you, packed with loads of information for you to read. Um, and obviously we'll be inviting you for a packed lunch uh, because of COVID-19 uh, related um, um, restrictions, because they are still around, sadly. Um, and just enough for me to say, this is a wonderful plan that we've invited, been invited as citizens of Cape Town to occupy. I love the word from Megan, let's occupy this plan. It's ours. It's not for the bureaucracy of the city of Cape Town, but it's for every single individual, every single organization, every single business, non-governmental society, for every child to engage with, to deliberate over, and to ask ourselves, how can we contribute? Because as we've been reminded today, every single bit will help. Councillor, no pressure. <laughs> None whatsoever. But we have been invited as citizens to engage with the plan, and it is a fantastic plan. Now it's up to you to close off this incredible uh, gathering. Councillor Pindile Makwiti, MECO member for Energy and Climate Change. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues. I am not going to take much of your time because I think everything that was supposed to be said here is said. But allow me to take this opportunity and thank all the speakers and those who contributed to the launch of this program. In particular, the Executive Mayor of the City of Cape Town, Mayor Dan Plato, for his input the C40 Regional Director for Africa, Mr. Hastings Chicago, who I believe is still with us virtually. The C40 Vice Chair for Africa, Mayor Sowa from Accra. And C40 in general, for the role you play in supporting city climate action leadership. I cannot forget the City of Cape Town Executive Director of Energy and Climate Change and his team and I've seen also his colleagues from the EMT. Uh, I must also actually thank them for introducing this uh, beautiful climate change action plan. I've listened to Megan, Manfred, and Shamila, and I want to thank you for your interesting insights in the issues of climate change. Let me also thank all the participants, both those within the municipality and our partners and stakeholders who joined either virtually or in person. As mentioned by various speakers already, we value your collaboration in working towards achieving the goals of our plan. I would also like to acknowledge the Energy and Climate Change Portfolio Committee. I've seen some members here, Councillor Sulelo is the chairperson, Councillor Greg Beck just left now, I really appreciate the work that they've been doing in support of this work. Finally, I want to thank the city's climate change planning team in the Sustainable Energy Markets Department for supporting the, the hard work in coordinating the development, approval, and design of this climate change action plan and organizing this uh, launch itself. The first steps in meeting a great challenge have been taken. We are not the biggest city, nor the richest, and the lives of many citizens are, are actually facing challenges. We face many challenging setbacks. We, however, have the choice to work together as a community, each contributing to a better society in some small way. The plans and decisions along this journey might not always be perfect, but fighting climate change is a, is a matter of our will to succeed. I thank you all for your participation today and invite you all to join us 
with your own plans, energy, and drive. Let's act for a stronger Cape Town. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor McClotty. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Have yourself a wonderful, wonderful Thursday, and let's act. Yes.